Good morning. It's good to be in God's house this morning. Amen. Amen. Got a few announcements uh, this morning. Uh, Soldier Bay Youth Group uh, will be watching a movie tonight entitled The Ultimate Gift uh, for those who would like to participate in that. And that's going to be at 5 o'clock back in the White House. Uh, also, um, the youth have also started a Bible study on Sunday nights. Uh, that will also be taking place in the White House. So I would encourage you uh, to please uh, try to be a part of that Bible study uh, for the youth who would like to be involved in that. I would encourage you to uh, participate in that if you were able. Uh, are there any birthdays or anniversaries we can celebrate this morning? I know uh, Mr. Danny Smith has one coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday, happy birthday. Is that right? <laughs> how old are you going to be? Or how old are you? <laughs> What's that? 58. 58. Well, happy birthday, happy birthday. Okay. <laughs> how many years, Mr. Sonny? No. <laughs> <laughs> Happy anniversary. Today's your anniversary. Well, how many years? 18 years. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. And let me just say, Gloria, I love you here. <laughs> Any others? All right, before we go into praise and worship, I'm sure many of you are aware of all that is uh, happening in Israel, and of course, let us continue to pray for all of those who are uh, being affected uh, by this, and just a, a passage of scripture um, reminding us uh, of the promises of our God. It says, I lift, in Psalm 121, verse 1 says, I lift my eyes toward the mountains. Where my help, where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and the maker of earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. Your protector will not slumber. Indeed, the protector of Israel does not slumber or sleep. So let us remember Israel. Let us remember all of those who are affected uh, by uh, the pains of war. And most of all, let us pray that the Prince of Peace will come and will establish his kingdom and will make all things new. So let us pray for the peace of Israel. Let us pray for their protection. For the Bible declares for us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So let's continue to do that. And as we pray, let us stand and go to the Lord in praise and worship. <laughs>
king is coming. Amen. He came the first time. He is coming back. It is my prayer that you're ready. Well, balcony, we are. Don't tell the fire code people. And we'll uh, we'll be in trouble. God bless you. Good looking group this morning. Thank you so much for being here. I would like to address one thing. Miss Patsy, you don't look older, but you sure do look tired. <laughs> and that's all I'm going to say about that. But uh, God bless you. Thank you for being with us this morning. Um, I want to do something just a, a little bit different this morning, if you don't mind, as we go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, I would love for you to continue to remember uh, Miss Paula Bennett, uh, rem continue to remember the Toby Babson family. Uh, Mr. Donald Ray Long uh, is in the hospital. Is that right? In the hospital. Okay. Mr. Donald Ray Long, uh, please continue to pray for uh, Mr. Eddie Bennett. Are there any other outspoken requests at this time? Jamie Davis, he's on our prayer list. Miss, Wa yeah, thank you, Miss Juanita, uh, Miss Debbie Duncan's mother. She's in uh, Novant Hospital and ICU. Please remember Miss Juanita's last name. Pruitt, thank you. I'm sorry. Brandy Harrison. Yeah, Miss Marcy, thank you. Miss Marcy broke her foot. She's in rehab. Yes, sir. His name, please, when you can. Lloyd Jones. Joins, okay. The Joins family. Church, would you do me a favor? Would you please stand this morning? I want to, I want to invite you, if you would. We're going to go into a time of prayer, and I want to call you to the altar as we spend time in prayer this morning for our cares and concerns uh, but also I want to pray specifically this morning for Israel. Uh, uh, some of us have a dear friend in Israel by the name of Rizik. Uh, I was talking with Rizik uh, uh, last night, early morning in Israel this morning, uh, asking specifically how we can pray for Israel this morning. He was very short and to the point. He said, please, dear brother, pray for peace in Israel uh, this morning. If you would love to join me at the altar, I invite you and call you there now. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we bow before you this morning. Lord, we thank you for this privilege of worship this morning in your house. Heavenly Father, I, it's very safe to say this morning, unlike other areas of the world, unlike Israel this morning, we're not gathering under the threat of attack or the bombs bursting or the missiles coming in. For lack of better words, Lord, we've gathered this morning under your provision and under your protection, under the arm of your and the hand of your safety this morning. Lord, we do lift up the many cares and concerns that are on our mind and our heart this morning, those families that have lost loved ones. Heavenly Father, those that are waiting uh, for surgery and some that are waiting on literally answers this morning. Those that are healing physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Heavenly Father, uh, we pray for each and every one that's here this morning. Heavenly Father, I want to turn my attention now to your people. Heavenly Father, I want to pray right now, and I just ask the church to join me. And, and church, I just want to ask you, if you're by someone that you love, would you just reach out and hold their hand? You don't have to. You don't have to. But let's just gather this morning as, a, as the local church here in Ash, North Carolina. Let's turn our attention now to the, to the family to the government, and to God this morning for Israel. Heavenly Father, is literally Israel is under attack. And, and you know, sometimes we say, well, it, it's been constant because it has. But Heavenly Father, I want to pray for Israel right now. I want to pray for, for our dear friend, Rizik and his family. Lord, I want to pray for Kada this morning. Lord, I want to pray this morning for the family of a, Dear man, we met by the nickname of One Dollar. I don't know his real name, but his family that we met as well, his brother. And some people, they may be standing here this morning and going, well, I don't know anybody in Israel. We're under, every, under everything holy, we know Jesus this morning. We know David this morning. We know the men and the women in the Bible this morning. And Heavenly Father, we know according to the authority of Your Word this morning 
that Israel is your chosen people. Lord, I pray for the, the war to cease. I pray as the Bible commands us to pray. The psalmist said in chapter 25, verse 22, the psalmist says, and may we echo this in our heart this morning, Heavenly Father, redeem Israel, O God, out of her troubles. Father God, my, my, my mind goes to that orphanage in Bethlehem that, that, that we minister to, those children. Father, I pray for the clergy this morning, the churches this morning. Lord, I pray for your protection. Lord, I pray not only for Israel, but I pray for Iran. I, I pray for Hamas. God, I pray and lift up together as a church this morning. We pray for the groups that have and the countries and the people that have been attacking Israel since the foundation of the world. Heavenly Father, I pray for a calmness to the chaos this morning. God, I pray for peace for the perpetrators this morning. Heavenly Father, I pray that they experience, they, they see, they feel, they, they, they know your grace and love. I pray for their salvation. God, I ask this morning that once again the, the devil just release his grip on Israel this morning and dissolve the hate, dissolve the disunity, dissolve the turmoil. God, I pray for unity in the Middle East during the current devastation that's going on. Lord, I want us to think about Isaiah's words when he talked about in chapter 62 about the, the watchmen of Israel that were on the towers. May we be that as well this morning, dear Father. The watchmen on the tower of prayer for Israel. God, it's through Israel. If you allow me that we receive literally the word this morning that we have in church. God, it's because of Israel we have Calvary. Because of Israel we have the tomb. It's because of Israel we have Jesus. And I hope people know what I mean by that. Because God, you've used Israel to minister to ash. You've used Israel to minister to every person that's standing right now. So Lord, may we be faithful. Continue to pray. To be mindful and sensitive to the needs of others. And may our prayer not end here. Lord, we thank you for listening. We thank you for leaning our way when we call out. And as all things are asked in Jesus' name, we also ask this prayer. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, worship Your holy name. Everyone can stand. So
Amen. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Miss Rhonda, Pastor Zach. God bless you. Children's Church at this time downstairs. Y'all okay? If you have a copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I've titled our time together, Spiritual Maturity. Uh, I want to kind of give you a commercial, if I may, as we're turning there in Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to be reading verses 11 through 16 this morning, keeping the passage of Scripture that we're dealing with this morning in context. Uh, but uh, I, I, want you to, I want you to hang on and to hang out with me this morning. It is my prayer that the message this morning uh, makes sense. I'm not, I do not have, I will not have the time this morning uh, to, um, to, to, to expound and expose uh, the depth of, of, of these verses uh, in, in, in essence about 45 minutes of the time that I get to speak. And I need to shorten that up as well. Uh, however, uh, I want to lay a foundation. Uh, uh, I want to I want to lay a foundation this morning of where we're going to be heading and where we're going to be going uh, in the next couple of Sundays as we look at this text. 
Uh, I've got a quote I want you to look at on the screen if you don't mind. Uh, A.W. Tozer asked this question, and, and he said it like this. He says, what comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. I, I want that to marinate for just a couple seconds. I, uh, I want you to look at it, I want you reading it. And I want you to understand that question or that statement this morning. He said, what comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. And the reason A.W. Tozer can make a statement like that is, is very simple, that the, the priority that God has in your life, the priority that God has in your life is literally displayed in all of the other areas of your life. Does that make sense? Y'all, I'll preach to 1130 if y'all keep on. Hey, what you think about God goes through and every part of your life is impacted about what your decision is. The position of God in your life is the illustration that I've used a couple times of who's on the throne in your life this morning. Is it God or is it you? Uh, see, the position of God determines how you act every day. Uh, the position of God, what you think about God. And that's what Paul has been doing in literally Ephesians chapter 1 all the way up to chapter 4, verse 1. In essence, uh, 1, 2, and 3 has literally been dealing about the doctrine of Jesus Christ and the theology of Jesus Christ. But in chapter 4, verse 1, we're going to look at it in just a second, uh, just to kind of connect the dots. Uh, he, it, it leaves the practical, and excuse me, it leaves the, the theology and the doctrine a little bit, and now we're getting into the practical aspect of it. We're getting into the personal aspect of it, because if you say that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if you say this morning that you're saved and you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, then it ought to show up in our lives. That's why Paul said in 4, verse 1, just glance at it if you want to. He says, therefore, he says, walk worthy in your calling. So he begins, again, uh, just a review, he begins about the, the unity of the church, the mystery that he is exposed to the church. It's the, it's the unity, but now he's moving into the uniqueness. Can we agree? I, I'm, I'm grateful this morning that our, that our uh, Wednesday night, we've, uh, we had a great crowd Wednesday night. We're beginning talking about uh, what membership means, what church membership means biblically, and what it looks like and what it should look like in our life. Uh, this morning, our Sunday school teachers, uh, uh, some of them are going to be dealing with the, the foundation of the church out of First, out of first Peter. So what we're going to do is Paul begins to expose, if you allow me, he's going to begin to expose uh, about what Jesus, what God has done for the church. Uh, not the brick and mortar, but what you that are sitting here this morning, what God has done because of not just the unity of the church, but the uniqueness of the Christian. Can we agree on this statement, can we? That the church, the local church, the little C church and the capital C church, the kingdom, can we agree on this statement? The church is a priority to Jesus Christ. Can we agree on that? The church. See, don't forget that. The church is a priority to Jesus. And if it's a priority to Jesus, shouldn't it be a priority to us? Shouldn't Christians, shouldn't the church, shouldn't the, the capital C and the little c church be a priority? It was Jesus that said, it was Jesus that said in Matthew 16, verse 18, he says, I will build my, what's he going to do with it? Who's it belong to? Him. Who's going to do it? Church is a priority to Jesus. The local church, the, the Christian is a priority to Jesus. And church will not be a priority to you unless God's a priority to you. And what God has done in His sovereignty, in His providence, in His love for the church, which is the Christian, with His love for the church, is He has taken away... You're going to get sideways with me here, but just hang on. He has taken away everything that could possibly hinder the building of the church. Uh, uh, Jason, uh, no, he hasn't. What about the devil? Hey, the devil's been defeated. 
If there's anything hindering you this morning, if there's anything hindering you this morning for growing and building the kingdom of God, it is something that you've put there, not God, not Jesus, because he's dealt with everything. He's taken care. He's even taken care of death. What did he say after he said that, that I will build my church? What did he say? He said the gates of hell will not even prevail against it. What does that mean? Death. Death can't even affect the church. Death can't, it, it can't divert the church. It can't delay the church. Is, church a pro- is God a priority to you? And if it's a priority to Jesus, shouldn't it be a priority to us? See, he's given us the commission. He's given us the commandment for the building of the church. Jesus Christ has given us the goal. What does he say? He says, go and make disciples. Of every nation, of every tongue, of every tribe. He's given us the goal. He's given us the marching orders. He says go. Not only has he given us the goal, he's given us the grace. He's given us the grace to be a Christian. That's what Ephesians 1 through 3 has been about. Talking about the grace. It's by grace you have been saved. Have you ever thought about this? Jesus will never call you. The Holy Spirit will never dispatch you somewhere. The Holy Spirit will never send you to somebody unless the Holy Spirit's going to go with you. He's always going to be with you. He's always going to go with you. And Jesus Christ has never asked us to do anything that he didn't do himself. So he's there with us. He's given us the goal, he's given us the grace, but he's also given us the gifts to be able to do that. With your Bible open, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, I'm going to read through 16, but you're going to see in just a moment, I'm just going to read or deal with verse 11 this morning. If you're there, say amen. Now watch this now, he says, and he himself gave, now I'm going to come back to that in just a minute, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Don't miss that. And if you mark in your Bible, I want you to underline verse 12. I'll deal with that next Sunday. But listen to me. He says, for the equip... Why did he give us the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers? For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come... Watch this now. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to measure the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried away, or excuse me, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knitted together by every joint supp- by whatever joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, cause growth of the body, causes growth for the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now, now that's a lot of information. That's a, that's a lot of words. There's a lot of churchy words in that. But church, look with me at verse 11. And he himself, who is he? It's Jesus. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. I want you to see one major truth this morning. One major truth this morning. I want you to see that the Lord enabled the ministers. The Lord enabled the ministry. Now, if you're taking notes, listen fast. There are five passages grouped together in the New Testament that gives us the spiritual gifts that are given to us by the Holy Spirit. Every Christian receives a spiritual gift at the moment of salvation. It is dispatched and it is deposited into your life as a Christian. There are really, some people, it varies, but there are about 20 different spiritual gifts that are given. Uh, Real quick, in Romans 12, 6 through 8, spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 8, 10, spiritual gifts. 28 and 30, spiritual gifts. Ephesians 4, 11, spiritual gifts. 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11 are the spiritual gift passages of Scripture in the Word of God. But so, we, so we, when we talk about the spiritual gifts, we have to understand, we have to have a working definition of what a spiritual gift is. Matter of fact, margin Scripture, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6. I want you to listen to this first now. This is Paul talking about what spiritual gifts are. Now listen, it's very important, it's vital. Paul says there are diversities... 
He says there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Everybody say Holy Spirit. Now watch this. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. So everybody say Lord. All right, you're doing good. Now listen. He says, and there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God. Say God. Who works all in all. So what did, what did Paul, watch this now. This is, this is cool. What does Paul do? He lit, he's talking about the spiritual gifts and he involves the Trinity. He mentioned God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Well, why does he do that? Because we see unity does not always mean uniformity. In unity, just like the local church, there is diversity. We are a multi-generational church. The local church here at Soldier Bay Baptist Church, everybody that's here this morning, each and everybody that's here this morning has a spiritual gift if you're a child of God. So not only is there unity, not necessarily means uniformity, but there's diversity in uh, the local church. So in the diversity, so because there's diversity in the Trinity, is there diversity in the Trinity? Is there diversity in the Trinity? Absolutely. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit do not do the same thing. They are all, they are all God, but they have different roles. They have different responsibilities. So we see Paul establishes the diversity, uh, or he shows us the diversity in the Trinity to show us the diversity in the spiritual gift. He shows us the diversity in the local church. So in other words, the diversity of the gifts comes from the principles of the Trinity. Is this making sense? Y'all are just being kind. Watch this. Uh, so the Trinity is functioning just like the local church is the function. Uh, there's to be the unity, but there's also there to be that of the diversity. Now, spiritual gifts, are. Not, I haven't even got to the definition yet, and I'm well aware of that. But don't confuse spiritual gifts with natural talents. See, natural talents are given to you at natural birth. Some of you are born with natural talents. You have natural talent. I will go on record telling you I have no natural talent. I, I do not have any natural talent, but what little bit of talent I may have, I receive at my natural birth. Same way with you. So even though natural talents are given at natural birth, it applies the same thing to the spiritual gifts. Spiritual gift or gifts are not given to you until your spiritual birth. Do you know why I'm able to stand here today and somewhat, whether you agree, with, agree or not to this statement, do you know why I'm able to stand here today and preach and proclaim the Word of God, maybe be as poorly as it possibly is, but the reason I give it my all, do you, only, you know the reason I'm able to stand here is because of the spiritual gift that the Holy Spirit has deposited in my life. It's only because of Jesus I'm able to stand here today. Do, hey, what... You think I could do this naturally? Some of you are saying, I don't know if you're doing it spiritual or not. If that's what you're thinking, get out. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, but the point is, hey, watch this now. Spiritual gifts are spiritually given. Never forget that. Spiritual gifts are spiritually given. There's three categories of spiritual gifts. Uh, we still haven't got to the definition. Hold on. There's three categories of spiritual gifts. There's the serving gifts, there's the speaking gifts, and there's the sign gifts. There are people that believe. There are people that believe, but I don't believe this way, and I'm going to explain why. I'm not just saying I don't believe something and not tell you why. There are people that believe what Paul was talking about here of the prophets, of the, uh, uh, of the apostles, of the prophets, of the pastors, and the teachers, and the evangelists. Some people believe that these are not spiritual gifts. But I want you to understand something. When Paul was talking about in 1 through 3, he says grace has been given to us by Jesus. And he changes, he changes the direction in chapter 4. Not only has grace been given, but the gifts have been given by the Holy Spirit. And that's why I think these, uh, I, think it, uh, I think it's very safe to say that we can, we can say that the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers are spiritual gifts because of the first three words, or first four words in verse 11. And he himself, that's Jesus Christ, that's two, uh, 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 two pronouns there pointing to Jesus, and he himself, what's it say? What's the very next word? Say it with me. He gave. It's been dispatched to us by Jesus. It's been given. These, uh, these are prophets, evangelists, apostles, pastors, teachers. You're going to hear that a lot today. They have been given the ability 
that, that, that they have, these men and women have had, is only because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what is the definition of a spiritual gift? It is a God-given. It is a God-given. You don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't produce it. God produces it, and guess what? The Holy Spirit promotes it. Uh, the God, it is a God-given ability or skill that enables a believer to perform a specific function in the body of Christ. But wait a minute. With effectiveness. With, that's got to be there. Uh, with effectiveness. So it's a God-given ability or skill that enables a believer. And if you're a believer this morning, you have a spiritual gift or gifts to perform a specific function in the body of Christ with effectiveness. I want you to do me a favor. The best you can right now. You can do it here. You can do it here. Uh, tr find your pulse right now. Do it. Do it. Y'all like playing along? Do it. Find your pulse right now. Uh, you can do it here. Or you can do it here. You get your pulse. You got it? Do you, can I ask you a question, whether you're feeling for it or not? Question, do you have a pulse this morning? There's about five of you. I don't know if you do or not yet. But listen, uh, uh, do you have a pulse this morning? Do you have a pulse this morning? Guess what? If you have a pulse this morning, you have a purpose in the kingdom of God. You got a pulse, you got a purpose. And the Lord has enabled the ministers of the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. The Lord has done it. He has given, and he, and he brings. But watch this now. This is where, the, of, 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 of the five clumps of Scripture dealing with spiritual gifts, the Ephesians 4 part is the leadership, if you'll allow me, the leadership of the church. So let's look at the first one. There's four classes of leadership. Believe it or not, there's not five, there's four, because the word, the Greek word that's used there for pastor and teachers is the exact same word. With the translation, it's pastor and teacher. But I'll get to that uh, probably about 10, 15. But look at the very first class. He says that of apostles. Now, uh, we need to understand this. Stay with me. Be patient. Be kind. Be long-suffering. Because I pray it's all going to make sense at the end when I lower the boom on you. So we have that of apostles. Well, who are the apostles? Well, we have to understand that Jesus selected the apostles. Uh, there are the apostles, and then Paul is an apostle. It is Apostle Paul. The apostle is one that has been sent in official capacity by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It was Paul that said in 1 Corinthians 9.1, a uh, margin scripture, 1 Corinthians 9.1, he says, am I not an apostle? Have I, have I not seen the Lord? Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 7 to 9. Uh, this is Paul talking. Listen to what he says. And after that, he was seen. Who was seen? Jesus was seen by who? James. Then by all the apostles. Notice the title that Paul gives. Uh, they were, he was seen by James and then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me. Also by one born out of due time. For I am, listen to the title. Paul says, for I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. So it was the apostles that, watch it, look at, look at me now. It was the apostles that laid the foundation of the church. It was the apostles. There were many disciples of Jesus Christ. Y'all okay with that? There were many disciples, but Jesus selected the apostles. And they are the ones, watch this now. They are, this is so good. They were the ones that established the church that laid the foundation for the local church to go into the future. Now, now don't miss that. It, 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 it's, it's, it's because of James. It's because of Paul. I, I, I really truly believe it is because of the apostles that we're able to worship here this morning at Soldier Bay Baptist Church, 3905 Whitewell Road. Hey, the gospel came out of Israel and landed in ash. The, we're here today. The foundation was laid by the apostles. Uh, number two, look at the second class. We're, we're going to go quick. Number two, he says the prophets. Now, it, it's very safe to say that the apostles are the foundational ministers of the local church. The foundation. The, don't miss my analogies now. It's going to make sense here in a minute. Uh, the, the prophets were foundational ministers as well. The prophets were, the prophets were, see, there were, there were prophets even, There were prophets even before Jesus came to earth. Y'all okay with that statement? Okay. Uh, I, some of you say there was prophets before Jesus. No, he always has been. Okay, there was prophets before. We, we know about that. But they were also the foundational 
the apostles laid the foundation, and then the prophets came and started building on it. Because of what they did, because of their position, because of their, uh, their calling, they started building on that. See, prophets did not tell the future. No, 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 never say that. That the prophets told the future. They didn't tell the future. They foretold what was going to happen by thus saith the Lord. And if they said it, guess what? How many of you, uh, you, ever, you ever pay attention to fortune tellers? You ever pay attention to horoscopes? You ever pay attention to fortune cookies? Some of you might. Now listen to me just a second. How much of that stuff has ever happened? Do y'all know that, did y'all know that the world, did y'all know Jesus was supposed to come back at the eclipse? He didn't, but he will. Uh, when the prophet spoke, you, be, you better buckle up. It, it was going to happen. I love what Paul says, and, and, and when I think about the prophets, I kind of think about what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 too. He says that prophets, he, he didn't talk about prophets, but Paul was talking about uh, getting, an, uh, getting a foundation of understanding the Word of God. He said it's the understanding of all mysteries and all knowledge. See, that's what the prophets did. They understood the mysteries. They understood the knowledge of God because it was given to them by God. See, prophets were able... Watch this now. Pro, this, is, this is good. Prophets were able... Prophets were able to... Prophets were able to do something you didn't do. You can't do. I can't do. When the prophets received the Word of God, they received the Word of God immediately. We don't receive the Word of God immediately. Mm -mm. Y'all, the canon is closed. We don't, re watch this now. Do we receive the Word of God? Absolutely, but we don't receive it immediately. We receive the Word of God through meditation. We, this is how we receive the Word of God. And you may say, well, I read it immediately. That's not what I'm saying. See, when God spoke, the prophets heard. When God spoke, the prophets preached. And it was true. What, did, what, did, uh, what does Luke record in Acts chapter 11, verse 28? Another margin scripture, Acts eleven twenty-eight. 28. Listen, uh, it's talking about the, they were moving, the prophets were moving, the disciples, the apostles were moving from Jerusalem to Antioch. And, and listen to what Paul says. Paul says, then one of them named Agabus, you don't like your name? You could be Agabus. But listen to what he says. He says, one of them named Agabus stood and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a famine throughout the world. So we even had the prophets in the New Testament. And these two, leaders, these two leadership positions, that of apostles, that of prophets, start, watch this now, started, I truly believe, you may, you may disagree with me and that's okay, I still love you in the Lord. Listen to him very closely. The, the leadership position of the apostles and the prophets started winding down at the end of the New Testament. Not today. Not today, y'all. Could God raise an apostle? Could God raise up a prophet? Absolutely. He can do whatever he wants. He's like the thousand pound bear. He can do what he wants. Absolutely. But those two, watch this now, those two positions started winding down at the end of the New Testament. But now watch what, watch what Paul does. Now he brings us to the evangelist. I have to lay this groundwork, y'all. What's the evangelist? The evangelist is the one that preached the Word of God and they moved about. We have evangelists today. A amen. We have evangelists today. A and evangelists even in the Bible, and I'm going to show you a couple of evangelists in the Bible in case you didn't know it, uh, but the, the, the evangelists went out started preaching the gospel and they would move around. Watch this. They would get into a community where the apostles had already been and they would, they would be planted there by God to start growing the church. So you, you notice what's happening now? There's a building up and there's a going. Are y'all okay? Uh, there's a building up and there's a going out of the gospel because of these callings, because of these spiritual gifts that have been given by the Holy Spirit to these men. Uh, so that they would, they would plant churches, they would be a part of planted churches, and they would continue working in the churches that were there by the apostles. One of the most famous evangelists in the Bible is Timothy. Timothy was an evangelist because in 2 Timothy 4, 5, Marjorie Scripture, 7, Tim, uh, 2 Timothy 4, 5, what does Paul tell Timothy? He says, but you be watchful 
be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of the evangelist to fulfill your ministry. So here we have specifically Paul giving the title, given the calling because of the gift that's been given to Timothy by the Holy Spirit of doing the work as the evangelist. Uh, who's our evangelist today? Uh, who was our evangelist for many years in the United States? Starts with a B. His name was Billy Graham. He's an evangelist. He moved around. To my, knowledge, to my knowledge, to my knowledge, he never pastored a church. He was an evangelist. Evangelist Junior Hill. To my knowledge, I don't know if he ever pastored a church. But he was an evangelist. There are evangelists out there today. As bad as I hate to say it, Chip Hanna is an evangelist. Poor, very poor. I'm just kidding, brother. Uh, but Chip Hanna is an evangelist. But look here. Evangelists is not about having 10 sermons and 10 suits and traveling the world. Evangelists are those that have been given a gift by the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel and it impact the hearts of the people. That's what they do. That's what they do. Uh, every sermon I preach, the gospel, prayerfully, every sermon I preach, the gospel will be in it. But every sermon that I preach is not an evangelistic sermon. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, uh, this is not an evangelistic sermon in a sense. We'll get to the evangelism si side of it at the invitation. But an evangelist preaches the, the, uh, preaches the gospel. It's a gift they have. Because of the foundation that's been laid by the apostles and the prophets. And then fourthly, pastors and teachers. Now, I, 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 Jennifer, I, I just kind of noticed something. You don't have to, y'all don't have to agree with this. You don't have to agree with this all. But this is how my mind works sometimes. We, we, see, the, we see the apostles, we see the prophets, we see the evangelism, excuse me, the evangelists. But now Paul wants to talk about the pastors and the teachers. Will you walk with me for just a second? It's almost like now Paul is carrying us inside the church. Does that make sense? It's the pastors and the teachers of the local church. I know evangelists come and speak. I know evangelists come in our... We've had evangelists in our pulpit before. I, I know evangelists have tents outside the church and on grounds and stuff like that. But, but, but I see, watch this now. This is... Ah, I gotta go. The, the Pat, Paul now moves, let's, hey y'all, let's walk inside the church. Let, let's walk inside the church and see how God has gifted men with the spiritual gift of being pastors. Uh, teachers is synonymous. I'm not going to make it synonymous this morning as far as the pulpit because I want to talk about our Sunday school teachers in a moment. But what is the gift that has been given to the pastors? Well, it's a word, pastor literally means shepherd. Uh, let, let, me get, let me help you with something real fast. Uh, never call me the shepherd of Soldier Bay Baptist Church. Never, ever, never, ever let me hear you say you're the shepherd of Soldier Bay. Because, sir, ma'am, I am not the shepherd of Soldier Bay Baptist Church. Jesus Christ is the shepherd of Soldier Bay Baptist Church. I'm the under-shepherd. Pastor Zach is the under-shepherd. It, it is the Bible. It is the Bible that says God, that God is the shepherd. It is the Bible that says that. Genesis 40, as early as Genesis 49, 24, the Bible says that God is the shepherd, the capital S-T-O-N-E, the stone of Israel. God's the shepherd. In the New Testament, uh, that's why David said in Psalm 23, the Lord is my... Old Testament, leaders were called shepherds. New Testament, Jesus comes on the scene. And he's referred, he refers to himself as the good shepherd, the great shepherd, and the word calls him the chief shepherd. And guess what? Pastors today are under the shepherd. Where churches get in trouble is when the pastor becomes the shepherd. What's the job of the shepherd? What's the job of the pastor, of the teachers? Here it is. Thank you all for being patient. I don't know if this made sense or not. You know what my job is? You may think you know my job. You may think you know Pastor Zach's job. But here's my job. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Well, how do you do that? You do that with the Word of God. Preaching and teaching the Word of God. Sir, ma'am, you need to appreciate your Sunday school teachers more than you do, probably. 
parents of the Sunday school teachers for our kids, for our nursery. You need to love on them. You need to tell them thank you. Because they're preparing, they're teaching, and presenting the Word of God. For our teenagers, for our young adults, for our senior adults, you need to be thankful for our teachers. Because they study the Word of God, not just to, for the Word of God to enter your ears and for you to do nothing with it. But what is taught, what is proclaimed, from thus saith the Lord, is not just for your ears, but everything they do to study the Word of God is to impact your heart. They have been gifted. The Word is the shepherd's staff. It's the staff that the shepherd has that provides protection, that provides provision. And when we get in trouble, when we get in trouble in the local church is when we replace anything else with the Word of God. It, the Word of God has to be there. It has to be paramount. Jesus Christ, in your Sunday school lessons this morning, Jesus Christ is the foundation of the church. But sir, ma'am, the pastors and the teachers can't do it by themselves. We'll sit back and let, let 20% do 80% of the work. We'll sit back and let 10% do 90% of the work. Sir, ma'am, listen to me very carefully. Listen to me very carefully. I'm saying this in love. I'm saying this in love. If you get mad and leave, I'm sorry. But come to me and, and, and I'll apologize because I hurt your feelings because that is not my intention. But sitting back and letting somebody else do something that you've been gifted to do is not the sign of a healthy church. It is not the sign. It is not healthy. And most importantly, it is not biblical. Because if you're a child of God, you have been given a spiritual gift or gifts. And you need to figure out what that is and where that is and then how to utilize it for the building up and the spreading of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Dr. Lewis Schaefer, uh, he was an evangelist and he led both singing and preaching. I mean, he did it all. I mean, he did it all one time after one of his uh, one of his series, an old lady came up to him. She said, Dr. Chaffer, you're doing too much. You ought not to lead the singing and the preaching. She said, matter of fact, you ought to let somebody else do the preaching. <laughs> it's, hey, it's, I want to ask you a question. I, 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 need to, I need to get everything ready, and I don't want y'all to do what y'all do sometimes. Uh, Miss Rhonda, Miss Lisa, if you'll get in place. Just me and you talking, listen in, lean in for just a second. I want to ask you a question. I just want you to answer in your heart. Does the world need the church today? I said answer in your heart. Hey, I got your last question. Watch this. Does the, does the world need the church today? Are you part of the church? then what are you doing taking the church to the world? You've been given the gift to do it with. What are you doing? Are you doing your part? We agree that the world needs the church. But what are we doing? On October the 20th, 2001, I said right here, well, right here, October 20, 2001, I stood right here and said yes to Ron the Sin. December the 5th, 2001, I stood right there in those waters with Pastor Charlie. And I was baptized. Why? Because I said yes, I wanted to be identified as a Christian. I, I, my background's Methodist. I grew up in a Methodist church, 27 years. I'd been... But I wanted to be baptized by immersion because that's what my Lord did. But I said, yes, I want to be baptized. On August 2003, I knelt right there and I was ordained deacon of Soldier Bay Baptist Church. I said, yes. 
on November the 15th, 2009. I came right here. November the 15th, 2009, I, I came right here, and I did this right here. Pastor Charlie came on this side of me, and I said yes and surrendered to the ministry to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. On January the 24th, 2012, I stood right there and said yes to the ordination service to preach the gospel. I didn't know where I was going, didn't know what I was going to be doing, but I said yes. On September the 1st, 2016, I stepped inside this pulpit and said yes to Soldier Bay to be the pastor of the church. I didn't know what I was doing. I know what some of you think. I still don't, brother. What you think about God is the most important thing about you. And when you get to a place where you understand where Jesus said yes to Calvary, you always say yes to Jesus. There should never be a no to Jesus. And some of you this morning need to come and say yes because you told him no way too long. You need to come this morning and say yes to salvation. You need to come this morning and say yes to serving and utilizing the spiritual gift or gifts that God has given you because He's laid the foundation for you through the apostles, to the prophets, to the evangelists, and to the pastors and teachers. Would you stand? Will you put your yes on the table this morning? Will you come? Just come. Good morning. Thank you so much for being with us this morning with our online services here at Soldier Bay. We were so, we're so glad that you joined us. Here on the screen, you see our email address and our phone number to the church office. Is God dealing with you about something this morning? We would love to pray with you. We would love to speak to you. If we can help you during this time of a prayer concern, or, or maybe it's your relationship with the Lord. Maybe it's your walk. Whatever your spiritual need is this morning, please feel free to reach out to us. As always, God is good all the time. Thank you. God bless.